Now, for many of us who've gone overseas, fought for this country, fought for Mississippi, we fought for Alabama, we fought for North Carolina, we fought for Illinois, and we fought for every state in this union. Now, we're going to stay here and see that the things that the mayor has said become a reality. Fifteen minutes past midnight, Evers got out of his car beside his home in a Negro residential area. In a vacant lot about 40 yards away, a sniper fired a single shot from a high-powered rifle at Evers' silhouette. The bullet hit him in the back, crashed through his body, through a window into the house. He died within an hour at a Jackson hospital. You were in the former home of Mega Wiley Evers and Merle Evers in Jackson, Mississippi. Our address is 2332 Margaret Walker Drive. Meg was born and raised in a little town called Decatur, Mississippi. And he talked about, uh, when you read about him and listening to him talk, he talked about, he knew the differences, how the races that were made between the races. He said he never could understand it. Why? He talked about having white playmates. He had this friend. It was only after he got to, the, they would hunt and fish together. It was only about uh, when this friend got to be the age of 16 that uh, they went separated, went their different ways. Um, and he talked about seeing his friend. He, he was going downtown and he saw his friend standing on the corner with some other whites. And he said, of course, they called him nigger. His friend did so, but also, but he noticed his friend dropped his head when he said it. Uh, and so that's, that's how, what kind of situation he grew up in. And then he talked about, he said, I knew the difference that was made between the races. He could never understand why it was that way. He talked to his father about it, and his father would talk to him and tell him what your responsibilities are. But in reading and listening to people talk, those who knew Mega, the, it really came home to him just how much difference was made between the races and the things that would happen. He witnessed a lynching when he was only 12. And he said when he asked his father why would they do that to him, his father said that's what they do. And so Mega said, you know, I'm sure he was a little bit angry, uh, frustrated, he was hurt. So getting away from it, I said, getting away from Mississippi, Mega enlisted into the Army when he was only 16. And he served in World War II. And he talked about, as he traveled about, he said, defending America, it didn't matter about the color of his skin until he came back home to Mississippi. And on his 21st birthday, he tried to register uh, to vote, he and his brother Charles, who was also a veteran, and other veterans. He said these group of white men turned them around uh, with shotguns, ran them off with shotguns, and Mega said, we ran. We did not go up against those men. But it made Mega get serious. And he, that's when he got back into, he finished his other two years of high school at Alcorn. It was Alcorn College then, now Alcorn University. And he enrolled in college, majoring in business administration. After Mega, graduated from Alcorn and moved to Mount Bayou, Mississippi. And he was up in Mount, ba Mount Bayou at that time was an all black town. It was founded by blacks and it was run by blacks. And this young man named T.R.M. Howard lived in Mount Bayou who was a black man who was rich. And he had this insurance company. So he gave Mega his first job of selling insurance for him. And uh, Mega said he started out in the little town of Clarksdale, Mississippi, selling insurance. And then he ventured out onto the plantations. And that's where he was selling people, uh, trying to sell insurance out there. And Mega began to look at some of the conditions under which these people were living. And also, he talked about black people not even knowing what insurance was. And so, as he was talking to them and watching their conditions, looking at their conditions, and looking at the reactions that he was getting when he talked about uh, human rights, civil rights, the NAACP, registering, getting registered to vote, that kind of thing. And people would begin to get, tell Mega these stories, uh, which were true. What was happening to people in the area? Uh, in, in fact, there's, in many places there were no schools for blacks. And, and if you tried to register to vote, what would happen to you? Uh, what had happened to others and what could happen to you. So Mega was telling them that, but that's, you know, that's your right. 
And so once they would not allow Mega back onto their properties, you know, when the word got out what he was doing, um, he just, he started several boy, he uh, initiated several boycotts up there. Blacks could buy the gas, but you couldn't use the bathroom. The prices in the grocery stores in many, uh, on many t in occasions would go up when blacks went in and a lot of times they said you had to stand in line until the whites were served. And so Megan was saying, let's, you know, don't buy the groceries, don't buy the gas, we'll go somewhere where you treat it a little better. And these things were beginning to work because of Mega Evans. Before Mega, Mississippi had not had an NAACP uh, secretary, and his job was to come in and organize uh, 82 counties in the state of Mississippi, uh, getting people registered to vote, uh, t taking complaints, that kind of thing, and just checking what was going on. And uh, I believe he was uh, selected by the National NAACP office to do that after he tried to get into old University of Mississippi, which as I said earlier is you know, now Ole Miss. And when they denied him admission, this is when the National NAACP asked him to become field secretary. So to do that, he had to come into Jackson. You know, maybe at first they didn't take Mega too serious. It was only after he kind of came, he, after he came into Jackson and really began to get things flowing, so to speak, and then got uh, involved with the student movement. Uh, you had the uh, Freedom Riders and all of that who, who just came in. And I think that's when Mega, you know, people really begin to see this man is shaking things up. He will not give up. Um, when he challenged WLBT to make a speech, you know, blacks couldn't speak. You couldn't speak on, on I, I heard, I hadn't heard Meg Evans' voice, I heard it only when I went away to college. And so, you would, he was not on television, and he was not on radio. So, I think this is when people began to see, they were not, they were not gonna turn people around. People, uh, I call them the grassroots people, the foot soldiers began to get involved. Uh, women, children uh, began to get involved. Uh, and I think this is when they saw uh, this man is really shaking things up. Don't shop for anything on Capitol Street. Let's let the merchants down on Capitol uh, Street feel the economic pinch. Let me say this to you. I had one merchant to call me and he said, uh, I want you to know that I've talked to my national office today and they want me to tell you that we don't need nigger business. These are stores that help to support the White Citizens Council, the council that is dedicated to keeping you and I second-class citizens. Now, finally, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be demonstrating here until freedom comes to Negroes here in Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah. This is uh, where Meg and his family came to live in 1955. And it was historic in itself in that Meg and his family came into this neighborhood after he became field secretary. This was a neighborhood that was being, well, it was a subdivision that was being developed by two young black World War II veterans. This had never happened before uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, probably in the state of Mississippi. But these two veterans were developing a one street subdivision and they were uh, developing, uh, were constructing homes for what they called professional, middle class professional blacks. You had your lawyers, your doctors, your teachers, uh, business owners living on this one street subdivision. And then they were going to put the, place this subdivision in between two white subdivisions. It was kind of like a trial thing. Um, and this is where Mega came. He selected this particular lot because it was a house on the left and it was one on the right. And Mega knew what was happening and or what could happen. He knew the things that were happening to the family, the threats that were being made, those kinds of things. So he came in changing his house plans. For instance, uh, he didn't want a front door. So this is the, basically the only house in the area that does not have a front door. And he asked that because he said he wanted his main entrance through the cockpit. And he was going to teach his family that when they come into the driveway, they were always going to exit the car on the passenger side. That way they could use the wall in the car as a means of protection. Uh, the windows in the, on the east wall are higher than other windows, higher than houses uh, that look like this on this street. The first year of the house, they were here. Uh, someone shot through the 
this window, the living room window. And so that's when Mrs. Everset Mega said, put the kids on the floor so they would be lower than the windows, the beds would be. Uh, the second time it was shot in through was through their bedroom window. So this is when they all got on the floor. And so she talked about sometimes she would sleep with a gun and Mega with a pistol if he was here, uh, vice versa. But she, as I said, she was protecting her kids just as Mega was. You know, Mega knew his life. He knew people was following him. That's why he took all of these precautions. He talked about, uh, in meetings, he talked about uh, when he would get a car, he had this mechanic friend, he would take it to him and have it souped up, so to speak, to outrun the people who, were, who would, you know, chase him, these kinds of things. So that's why, you know, sometimes I think you have a calling and uh, you cannot let go. And I believe that's the way it was with Mega. That's the way, that's what he would talk about. I've had a number of threatening calls, people calling me saying that they were going to kill me, saying that they were going to blow my home up, and uh, saying that I only had uh, a few hours to live. Fifteen minutes past midnight, Evers got out of his car beside his home in a Negro residential area. In a vacant lot about 40 yards away, a sniper fired a single shot from a high-powered rifle at Evers' silhouette. The bullet hit him in the back, crashed through his body, through a window into the house. Mrs. Evers talked about she and her kids, you know, in the back of the house and hearing Mega drive up and not coming into the house. And um, then they heard, she heard the shots and she said, my kids began crawling across the floor to go to the bathroom because they had told Mega, should something happen, the safest place in the house is the bathtub. She said, so that's where they were headed until she heard a thump, like someone threw something on the house and it made her break for the door. And she said when she threw open the door, Mega was staggering, coming around her car, trying to get to this door. And she said she heard a couple of more shots, and she thought they still were shooting at her. But the other two shots she heard was Mr. Wells next door. Uh, Mr. Wells said, I wasn't aiming at anybody in particular. He said, I was just hoping to run whoever it was away. But he and another friend came to Mega's rescue, so to speak. And uh, Mrs. Ever said, Mega was lying face down with his keys in his right hand. She said, I thought he was dead, but he wasn't. He was saying something, but we couldn't understand him. But they brought him inside the house and uh, took a mattress off of the daughter's bed and put him on that mattress to transport to the hospital. In Jackson, Mississippi, in 1963, there lived a man who was great. He fought for freedom all of his life. But they laid Mega in his grave. Following his death, uh, the movement kind of seemed like it died a little bit. But anyway, you know, they had his funeral at, here over at the Masonic Temple. And after that, he was buried in Nash Arlington National Cemetery. After a period of time, no one was in the house and it had gotten in bad shape. So Tougaloo College asked her to let us have it, and she did. There are other exhibits about Mega in uh, other museums, but we knew we wanted to do something with the house. We may not have known exactly what we were gonna do. At first, we just opened, you know, people wanted to come and see where Mega Evers and his family lived. We just opened the door and let people flow in and flow out, and it got to the point where we said, well, we gotta say something about Mega. There are people right here in Mississippi who is my age or older who don't really know who Mega Evers was. And so that's what I want people to know. I want people to know who Mega Evers was. I want people to know what a big, what a great difference he made in Mississippi. And as I said, I learned later, not only in Mississippi, but throughout the, uh, throughout the, the world. One of the things uh, he said is, I like Mississippi. This is home. Uh, I like fishing here, I like hunting, and Mississippi is a wonderful place to grow up. He said, why should I leave? He said, I love Mississippi. And then when you look at it like this, had Mega left Mississippi, what about all of the other people? Everybody could not leave Mississippi or would not leave Mississippi. Why shouldn't you?
uh, as he would put it, you have the same rights to anybody else born here. So why should you have to run away to, to some unknown city or state to get a decent education, uh, to make a, a living for your family, to get a, a decent job, and support to be able to support your uh, family, to have a nice home? Why should you have to do that? And so Mega Evers decided to stay right here in Mississippi. And thank God he did.